be as well. And so uh, make sure you're coming out on, on Wednesdays and, and uh, Sunday nights as well because it's just been a great time that we've had uh, here. Uh, you know, on Sunday nights we, we have a prayer and then also uh, First Youth as well. And so we always have a good time with those. Um, and so make sure you check your bulletin and all those things as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, starting at verse 1, the Bible reads, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for uh, thou shalt find, uh, find it uh, after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If, uh, if the clouds be full of rain, they, attempt to, uh, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the, uh, if the tree uh, fall forward uh, uh, toward the south and, or toward the north, in the place where the tree uh, falleth, there it shall be. He that uh, observe, uh, observes the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest uh, not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones uh, do grow in the womb of her that is with child. Even so, thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Verse 6. In the morning, uh, in the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not uh, thine hand, for uh, thou knowest not whether, uh, whether shall prosper, either this or that. Whether uh, they, uh, they both uh, shall be alike, alike good, truly, uh, truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him, uh, let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many, and all that uh, come is vanity. Rejoice, uh, young man, in thy youth, and let your, heart, uh, let your heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the, uh, in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you uh, for your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, that I would be able to uh, convey your truth clearly. And simply, Lord, I pray that we would have ears to hear, and God, that we'd not be only hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well. And God, I pray uh, uh, for this morning's offering. God, I pray that you would bless the offering to the furthering of your kingdom, and God, that we would be able to reach a multitude for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said, if you have an offering, there is an offering envelope in front of you. Uh, you can fill it out uh, you know, there, or you can always uh, go online to Corollersville. Uh, first.com slash uh, donate and be able to uh, give that way as well. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, there's a lot of different, you know, there's a, a, a different areas, three or four different areas in which he's going to hit. He's, uh, you know, King Solomon, you know, has been going through basically his life. Like I, uh, I've, I've talked about before that in Ecclesiastes or the preacher as, you know, it is, you know, it is put out there is King Solomon is telling about his life as he's older. And it sounds, you know, you could be beginning to, you know, read, especially in the first several chapters, you're going, man, this, this guy just does not, is not happy with life. He is depressed about everything. Nothing seems to be going well in his life. But the thing is, is what he's telling us, because this, this man had received wisdom from the Lord. Um, he asked the Lord for one thing, and that was for wisdom. And the Lord gave it to him. And so he's going through and just letting us know, this is what he's found in his years of experience. And I've said this before, if you know, uh, you know uh, young people, if you have, you know, uh, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents in your life, you know, aunts, uncles, great-aunts, uncles, make sure you listen to them. Because, you know what, there's wisdom in what they have to say. I know that you may sit there and say, I don't want to hear another story about whatever. But the thing is, is that they're trying to impart wisdom to you so you don't do the same dumb things that, you know, they did. All right? You know, like myself, I try to tell my daughter, I said, this is what I did when I was a kid. And she goes, oh, that's awesome. I said, no, it's not. It was stupid. And so we need to realize that, you know, uh, parents, grandparents, uh, and, and great-grandparents and those, they have wisdom that they're trying to give you. So that way you don't end up in that same kind of trouble. But let's look at the first six verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 11. 
It says this, it says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for, uh, for thou shalt find, uh, find it after uh, many days. Give a portion to seven, and also, uh, and also to eight. For thou knowest not what evil shall come upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree, uh, and if the tree falls toward the south or toward the north in the place where the tree falls, there it shall be. He that observes the wind shall not sow, and he that regards the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones uh, do grow in the womb of, of her that is with child, even so, uh, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the morning withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether uh, whether uh, shall sorry for thou uh, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper uh, either this or that or whether they both shall be alike good. And so what we need to real, uh, realize in this first verse, I was sitting here reading this and I thought to myself, you know, over and over again, I said it seems too simple what he's saying here. It seems too simple, so then I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to go try and look this all up. And you know what the thing is? It is as simple as what he's saying here. All right? And so, but we see this one, and he says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. In other words, he's saying, you reap what you sow. That when you cast it out there, you know, when you give, you know, uh, give to somebody else, or, uh, or you, you know, um, those things are going to come back, you know, back to you. That what you have of your access you shall give, uh, receive it back. So in other words, if you have like extra money, and I know you say, well, I don't really have extra money at this point, but whatever you have you know, excess of, and you, you just go out there and you just say, I'm going to give it to somebody. The Bible says it's a promise that you will receive it back. This is not a name it, claim it, you know, prosperity message. It's fact of what the Bible says, that you reap whatever you sow. If you sow goodness, what are you going to get back? Goodness, right? It's not like the fact that you know the Bible you know talks about in, you know in other places where it says that if you if you sow a uh, you know like a, you know, a fig tree you're not going to get you know a rose bush right we know that whatever we shall reap whatever we put in the ground that's what we're going to get if we sow in the ground green beans are we going to get apples from it no we're going to get green beans it's the same thing the Bible is saying however you treat those in your life that's what you're going to you know get back so whether you give them money. The Bible says, uh, you know, or, you, you know, you're just, you know, good towards them, or you just treat them well. The Bible says that you're going to re uh, receive them back. So if you give to other people, it will come back to you. If you invest in other people, if you help other people, they're going to help you, right? It's a basic principle. If you go, I mean, there's a lot of people in this room that I know that, ha that help a lot of people, and then in their time of need, what happens? They get the help that they need, Right? And so that's what the Bible is, is teaching us here is basically being generous with your life and all that you, uh, that you have, that's also including the gospel. You need, to, you, know, you need to be generous with the gospel. You need to sow that seed. The Bible says that we need to go out bearing precious seed. We need to go out and generously you know, uh, sow out there. Will every single person receive the gospel when you put the seed out there? No. It's just the same way as when a farmer goes out and he plants a whole bunch of seed. Not every single seed grows, right? Not every single seed grows. But you put it out there expecting, you know, you know uh, that as you cast it out there, that something is going to grow eventually out of those areas. Not every single seed is, gonna bear, uh, is going to bear whatever it's going to be, but, you know, uh, there will be seed that will bear fruit as well. Verse 2 says, give a portion to seven and also... To eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be on the earth. He is just telling us here: be prepared for what's coming. Always be prepared. There is a, a guy that um, that we watch, you know, that we watch online uh, every so often. He's a meteorologist on YouTube, but he always has a saying of, "Don't be scared, be prepared." All right, and so because oftentimes people hear about bad weather and what ends up happening. If we hear a snowstorm's coming. Walmart's going to get bombarded. And what is our snowstorms here? Three, like two, three inches, and we're like, oh my goodness, shut down the city for a week. I remember when we first came here, within a month, there was a dusting, a, I mean, a literal dusting in Jackson, Tennessee. They shut down the entire town. 
Now, I'm originally you know, from north, uh, you know, northeast Illinois. When we talk about a snowstorm coming, that's about two, three feet. And I started laughing, and the lady's like looking at me like, what is your problem? I just asked her, I said, you know, I said, why is everything closing down? They said, oh, have you seen it out there? It's terrible. I said, terrible? She goes, oh, yeah, there's cars everywhere. I said, it's called slowing down. That's what it's called. You know, like if you have a little bit of snow on the ground, just slow down a little bit. You don't have to be going 90 miles an hour down the highway and then find yourself in a ditch. But that's what, what, you know, happened. And so I just kind of laughed because, you know, like I said, I'm originally from Illinois. So I just sit there and I go, okay, you know, snow's coming. That means I'm going to be doing donuts somewhere in some abandoned par- uh, parking lot. And you guys will go, uh-oh, I'm not going near pastor. Don't worry, I'm not doing the donuts out in the, you know, out in the back parking lot. I'll tell you that. But I thank God for uh, Jay who uh, went out there and he graded that lot, just so you know. He's not in here, but thank him on the way out. He went out and bought a grader and everything else and graded that parking lot to where you don't have bumps as you're going through. All right? But that's what, you know, and so basically he's just saying in this verse, which is obviously kind of opposite to verse 1. In verse 1, he's saying, hey, you reap what you sow, give generously, do what all you want. And this one, he's saying, hey, be prepared for what's coming, for, what, you know, for the evil that's coming. And the thing is that oftentimes people look at this as a, almost like a proof text for like hoarding or um, stockpiling or have, you know, like going out and they're the ones buying all the toilet paper when the government you know, uh, decides that, that the, uh, the toilet paper is not going to be a good thing. And they got it down in their basement. They got like a whole stockpile of, of toilet paper down there because that stuff was like gold a couple of years ago. But that's, you know, and he's not talking about this because the Bible, you know, uh, talks about two different uh, viewpoints. We see with Joseph, when Joseph knew that, you know what, he said, in the seven years of abundance, we're going to hold back some because I know a famine's coming. So he said, I'm going to hold back some so that way during that time of famine, we have food. He's just giving practical advice here saying, you know what, it's always good you know, you know, to, to have stuff, you know, to have a, a little bit held back. But you don't need to be going back you know, you know, by and like ransacking haze over there and taking everything off their shelf so nobody else has it. Because he also does you know, uh, say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, it says, Take therefore no thought for, uh, for the morrow, for the morrow shall take care of, uh, for the things itself sufficient unto the day is the uh, evil thereof like i say don't be scared be prepared it's the fact like i know those people are waiting for the day of armageddon you have all these people you know trying to you know stockpile all this stuff down in their basements and everything else i'm not saying that you shouldn't have some sort of backup i'm not saying that i'm saying you know what we need to you know find a healthy medium between hoarding everything and like just sitting there saying well you know what i'll go out i'll go out and buy food every single day because we also need to realize that obviously when the Bible is written all the way up until probably a couple, maybe about 100 years ago, people actually would prepare for things. It wouldn't be, oh, wait, the meteorologist just told me a snowstorm is coming through or this is coming through, or a rainstorm or whatever, and all of a sudden everybody would run to the store. They would have a back supply of things. This came in the way of like canning foods. They gardened. That's something that you know you, that you don't hear about all that often nowadays, but like if there's a you know parents or grandparents in here, they know about this stuff because when I go visit my family, you know especially you know uh, like my great aunts and my grandmother, she would always be canning something. She'd have a garden out there. She'd have a you know pretty healthy sized garden. She'd have stuff that that she'd have off to the side that she would have for you know the meal that night. But then she'd always have something that she was putting back, so that way in the winter. If something bad were to happen, she didn't have to go out and run into the store. I mean, it makes sense, right? And so, as you know, you know, uh, as we you know saw about you know about a hundred uh, about a hundred years ago or less, is that they farmed to preserve their food, because you know hard winters to save money. Do you know you save money by canning your own stuff and and, and actually preserving your own stuff, and gardening? It is cheaper for you to grow your own food than to go to the supermarket. You want to say, I want to save some money? Get a garden. You say, I don't have the patience for it. You better get some patience, especially if you want to save money. But the thing is, is that, and also I remember my grandmother talking about this, the reason why she would do it is because she lived through the Great Depression. And people say, well, that will never happen again. Never say never. Never say never. And you had people out there fighting for, you know, for a loaf of bread back in the Great Depression. So don't ever say, you know, never say never. And 
you know, like I say, we, you know, we have that strange mentality that if there's some sort of bad weather or snow or whatever, or threat of a government stopping the sale of toilet paper, we run to Walmart and just buy up everything. I've seen it happen numerous times, and it's not just here, it's everywhere, that we have this mentality that the, that the grocery store is going to take care of everything that we need, that the government's going to take care of us. The most dangerous words that you can ever hear is, I'm with the government and I'm here to help. You cannot rely upon the government to help you all the time. That's where most people have gotten the, you know, have ran into issues is because they wait for the government to do everything for them. And what have you become to the government? You become a slave to the government. Because if the government, you know, at any point says, I don't like what you're saying, I don't like what you believe, I don't do, they can just sit there and say, I'm not going to, we're not going to supply for you anymore. And then what do you do? Because going on YouTube ain't going to feed you. All right. So what I'm saying is, have, use some common sense. Use you know, uh, use a lot of the stuff, the resources that we have out there. I mean, there's there's organizations that are like my wife. My wife is learning how to like can and preserve things, uh, you know, garden and beekeeping and all this other stuff. You say, well, why does she need to learn that? Because the thing is that we know that we can't re- you know always rely upon the government. And here's a, here's the best part of the whole thing. They're paying her to learn this stuff. Now think about that. You go, you go, and you learn this class, you learn this stuff, they give you all the equipment that you need, and they pay you. Sounds like a pretty good deal, don't it? I don't know, I thought it did. But what we need to also do is the fact that we need to, um, like in verse 1, is the fact that, you know, you, you reap what you shall sow, but the thing is, is that we need to remember that we need to keep an eye on world, you know, on the world events. We don't get freaked out by them. We don't sit there and watch eight hours a day of CNN or Fox News or OANN or who, whatever news source. But you, you need to keep an eye, obviously, on the world events and see what's going on because that's where you know things are going. Philippians four nine says, but and realize this. Philippians four nineteen tells us our view that we should realize this. But my God shall supply all your need according to the, uh, His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Know that God's going to supply, what, all of your needs. Not all of your iPhones, but all of your needs. Whatever you have need of, it says that, you know, that's God's promise. He says, you know, if you're a believer, he shall supply all of your need. Amen? Luke uh, chapter 12, verse 31 says, But rather seek ye uh, the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. When we are, we are seeking after God and his kingdom and what he would have for us, what does he say he's going to do? He's going to add all these things you know, unto you. Those are the promises of God saying, you know what? Yes, there are going to be all these different you know, world events and all these things happening, but you know what? I'm going to supply all your need and all these things are going to be added unto you. When you do what? When you're seeking him. When you seek after him and you're saying, you know what, God? Above all, I want what you would have for me. Because that's the problem, is that when we say, you know, God, I got this, that's where we get ourselves in, you know, uh, that's where we get ourselves in, in problems. Verse 3 says, if the clouds be full of rains, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the, the place where the tree falls, there it shall be. You say, what does that mean, Pastor? Life continues, life goes on, life happens. He's just saying, you know what? If the clouds are full of rain, what's the natural, what's the natural thing that's going to happen? They're going to empty themselves, right? Clouds don't hold you know, rain just going every single, you know, over every you know, place, just going around, but like, I don't know what to do with this water. No. When the uh, clouds get full of rain, what do they do? They empty themselves, just as he's saying. He says, if, a, if a, a tree falls to the south or to the north, what happens? There it shall be. He's just saying life continues, life goes on, um, that some things in your life are just going to happen. And you have no control over it. If a tree falls over, do you have control over that tree? No. It's just going to happen. Things are the way they are, and some things are not worth questioning. There are just some things you just go, I mean, some people, like the person that said, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? That's, a, that's honestly, to me, that is like one of the dumbest questions you could ask. The fact that you sat there and you thought about that and pondered and actually used brain power to go, does it make a noise? And you're sitting there, you know, wondering, I mean, that is the ultimate, like, me question. 
Because you're saying, well, it doesn't make a noise. You know what? You're relying upon your common sense, which apparently you don't have common sense, because you, a common sense says if a tree falls, it's going to make a noise. I mean, it just, I don't know. I'm sorry, you know, for sounding so blunt, but it's just common sense. And if common sense was so common, then, you know, we'd whole, be a whole lot better, wouldn't we? Verse 4, he that observes the wind shall not sow, and he that regards the clouds shall not reap. It's very, very basic. On the, you know, what are you saying here? If you're waiting for the perfect day to sow your seed or, your, uh, or to plow, then the, the entire planting season could be over before you plant everything. If you're waiting for that perfect, beautiful day, it's not going to happen. That's why you see farmers out there in all kinds of weather. Why? Because they're like, oh, if I sit here and wait, I'm going to be waiting an awful long time for that perfect, beautiful day. And they do come by, but you know what? They're not you know, as often as you know, that perfect day. So you might, you might as well go ahead and sow that seed while you have that opportunity uh, to do it. Things in life will not always be perfect. There are people that will sit there and wait to propose. Like you have a guy, oh, I'm going to propose to my girlfriend, waiting for the perfect occasion. I've heard of ones waiting for the perfect occasion, and they've been waiting for like six, seven years. I'm like, you haven't found that perfect occasion? Well, no, it's kind of passed by now. I don't, you know, and they just don't go ahead and get married. And, you know, they're like, oh, I don't know what to do because that perfect day never happened. You know what, it's not going to happen, you know, that perfect day may never come as far as you have it, but you know what, just go ahead and get those things done. And if you're waiting, for, like I said, if you're waiting for that perfect time or moment, you could miss your opportunity. Do what you can with the time that you have given. Don't sit there and wait, but the Bible says to redeem the time that we have. Not to sit there and just wait for that perfect opportunity. I mean, there's part of me that sits there and you know, thinks about you know, the fact that I was waiting you know, for myself in school to have that perfect time I was going to do my homework. That day never happened because, you know, there was a lot of times, you know, actually the perfect day did come. I should, I should you know, take it back. When my dad said, if you don't graduate high school, you ain't living at this house after, uh, after high school. I'll tell you that right now. The perfect day came, didn't it? Because all of a sudden I was like, I need to get about straight A's in order to, to pass and to be able to get my uh, diploma. And all those things. And so I actually ended up doing it. So that perfect day came when my dad's vengeance said, you know what? You better do it or you ain't living here. And I, do I know whether my dad you know, was going to do it or not? I didn't sit there and wait and question it. I didn't sit there and wait to find out if it was going to happen. I'm like, well, today is the perfect day to start studying. You know? But I, I honestly think, yes, my dad probably would have. And my mom would have been sitting there going, we can't do it. That's my baby. And you know what? I probably you know, needed you know, the consequences from that with my dad saying, you know what, you need to get out of the house you know, and go find a job or do something with your life because you're not doing anything with it. So I wouldn't have faulted my dad for kicking me out because I was, yeah. Don't follow my example. I'll just say that. Verses 5 and 6 says this, As thou knowest, uh, knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones uh, do grow in the womb of her that is uh, with child, even so... Thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold uh, not the, thine hand, for thou knowest not whether, uh, whether uh, shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they shall be, with, uh, they shall be alike good. You don't need to know how everything works or is done for you to, uh, is done for you to enjoy it. You know that? You don't have to know how everything works or how everything is done in order for you to enjoy it. I don't have to know how my phone works for me to enjoy it. I don't have to you know, necessarily know how my engine works on my truck in order for me to enjoy my truck, right? That's what he is saying. There are some things that, you know what, you don't necessarily have to know how they work to enjoy them, just enjoy them. Because there, there'll be people uh, racking their minds. Of course, I was always the inquisitive kid. My parents had a bunch of like, watches and different things around the house that did not work because of me. The reason why is because I wanted to know how it worked. So in order for that to happen, you got to take it apart. The only problem is I didn't know how to put it back together after I took it apart. But I had that inquisitive mind that I wanted to know. And my parents, you know, later on when they watched this, they'll probably be going, oh, that's why, you know, so-and-so's watch never worked again because, you know, Sean's been over there taking the whole thing apart. And I did. I would take stuff apart that I would find. I wanted to know how it worked. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I see how it worked. But I never knew how to put it back together. 
And you, you would think that having a mechanic as a father that I would figure out how to actually put stuff back together, but I never did. So now when I take something apart, I make, like, I make like detailed notes of how things go back because I know that eventually I need to put this thing back together. And so far, so good, I've been able to actually put stuff back together. It may take me two or three times to try and get it you know, to work right, but I'll get it back together and, I, and, you know, and it will work. That's the other part, it will work. Because there's been times where I put stuff back together and I'm like, I have no idea why this thing's not working. That's one of those things that we, uh, that we need to realize uh, that we go. And I mean, it's just like the fact of a, of a woman, when she has a child, you know, when she's with, a, you know, with child, does she sit there and have to wonder, like, I wonder how, you know, I wonder how those bones are, are growing? I mean, she can go on there and try to Google it and try to figure all that out, but she's not even you know, worried about it. She just wants to know whether or not that baby's going to be healthy when it's born, right? You don't need you know, to understand how a, a plant you know, grows in the garden to enjoy it. You don't need to understand how the bones grow in a baby in order to enjoy God's blessing, right? You don't need to, you know, to have all the answers to enjoy this life that God has given you. You don't have to know everything in order to enjoy life. Oftentimes, people that you know, try to understand every little detail oftentimes miss life. Why? Because they're so busy trying to figure out how everything works that they never get a chance to enjoy it. When something uh, happens and you don't understand it, just know that God is in control. That's all you need to know. You, you may go through life. You may have all these things. Something happens in your life. I don't understand it. And you go, you know what? He's still in control. Because there's a lot of things that in life you go, why did that happen? Why did this happen? Why did it? And you know what? I got to the point where I just said, you know what? I don't understand it, but God does. And he's in control. Amen? Number two is death and life. He's talking about death and life here. Let's read uh, verses 7 and 8. It says, truly, truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that uh, cometh is vanity. And so, life is, life is, is dear to, uh, should be dear to every man as the light of the sun is to the eye. Uh, Adam Clark said this, he said, A man would give all that he has for this life, and it is particularly dear to him when he is in ease and affluence. But he uh, let each remember that and even uh, have prosperity through the whole. Yet the days of darkness, times of affliction, weakness, and perhaps old age will be uh, many if he die, uh, if he die not a violent death which is not a uh, which no man can wish he will uh, die a lingering death which the ordinary uh, ordinary uh, attended with pains and many sorrows therefore let him prepare to meet his god and to carry uh, this thought through life that all uh, must terminate in life. In other words, he's saying, you know what? Enjoy your life while you have it because you know what? Everyone is going to die. Everyone's going to die. We don't like to think about that, but every day, you know, every day that we have, we should realize as a blessing. We should not sit there and worry about, you know, worry about these things. I've, I've met people that have literally worried themselves to death because you know that you can actually make yourself sick by your, your thought pattern. I mean, it's been scientifically proven. Of course, the Bible said it a long time ago, and nobody wanted to believe the Bible, so they had to have science or doctors to tell them you know, that truth. But you can literally worry yourself to death. And there are people out there that, you know, that's what they do. They just worry about, is today the day I'm going to die? Is this, you know, this going to happen? Is this? And they're just worrying, worrying, worrying. Enjoy your life while you have it, right? Because God has given you this life. He has blessed you with this life. And that's what we need to realize. As he says in Psalm 40, he says, But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O oh my God. The thing is, is that you can sit there and wonder and know that, you know, you say, you know, I'm poor and needy. And there's people out there saying that they're poor and they, got, they make more money than most people do. And they say, I'm poor. So it's a matter of perspective. But the thing is, is think about this. No matter how much money you have or you don't have, if you're saved, the Lord is thinking upon you. That right there, you know, uh, should bring a smile to most people's face. It doesn't matter about all the stuff that you accumulate or all the stuff that you have or all the stuff that you're going to get. I mean, we have Thanksgiving coming up this week. Let's not bypass 
thanksgiving and giving thanks to God for what he's given us and just move right on into the season that has become, you know, the season of give me. Give me this. Give me that. Let's be thankful. Because if we're thankful every single day of our life that when we go and we celebrate Christ's birth, we're going to be thankful. But we, uh, I've noticed that we go, you know, it seems like stores don't even care about fall. They don't care about the harvest anymore. They don't care. They go from Halloween to Christmas. Why? Because those are, you know, the next two holidays that bring them money. And they, that's all they care about is money. Instead of the fact of being thankful for a great and fruitful harvest that we just had, and, the thankful, you know, and that's what you're celebrating in Thanksgiving is the fact of God's blessing upon your life, that we should give you know, thanks and all those things. Then you know what? You go into Christmas, and you're not going around trying to punch somebody in the face because you know, somebody has a brand new Xbox or you know, a PS5 or 6 or whatever number they're on nowadays. I mean, the fact that you've got to turn on the news and you see people getting punched in the face because somebody had a Black Friday sale over a gift and be like, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus loves you, you know, and just punch the person in the face just so your child can have a, you know, a, a brand new Xbox or a PlayStation. The fact is, is that we need to be, you know, give thanks every single day that we have because God has given us those days and we shouldn't, we shouldn't take it lightly. We shouldn't take it lightly and when we go into, you know, the Christmas season, the holiday, you know, uh, we will be able to sit there and just thank God for everything that we have. I mean, I've moved away. I'm not saying that there's you know, not times where there's something that I want. But I've moved away from being a child of saying, give me, give me, give me, to say, you know what, I don't care if you give me anything. I just want to be around my family and friends. And I'm so thankful that the Lord you know, has blessed me. That's the way that we need to be. If somebody gives me a present, praise God. If they don't, praise the Lord. I don't care as long as I have family and friends and I get to worship my Savior. That's what I worry about. Amen? Number three is this, youth should, uh, should think about the day of judgment. If you're a young person in here, the Bible says that we should think about the day of judgment. It shouldn't, I heard a lot of people say, well, when I get older, when I get married, when I have kids, then I'll begin to think about church and Jesus and all that stuff. I've heard people say that, that's a, that's a horrible way. In other words, what they're saying is, I don't need God right now. I want to do everything because I think that God's going to, you know, be a bearer of bad news and tell me I can't do all these things, I can't do this or do this or whatever. I used to, I'll tell you this, before I got married, that was one of the things that I always thought about was, I'll just be honest with you on this. I'll just, you know, be flat out. I would sit there and pray that the Lord would not come back until I was married. Because that was something that I always wanted, you know, I, was just, I wanted to get married. I wanted to have kids. And I would tell the Lord, like, please, Lord, yes, Lord, I want you to come back. I do. But can you wait until I'm married? I should take a show of your hands because I can guarantee I'm not the only one in this church that has ever had that thought. Because, you know, the smiling faces and the nodding and everything else, I know I'm not the only one in this church that has thought that way. All right? But that's the way I thought. I would sit there and say, Lord, you know, I, I do. I want your second. I, I do. I want to go to heaven, but I want to get married first. Please wait. We need to begin to think about the day of judgment and the way that we live as people, right? About how you live. Because it's never too young to serve the Lord. It's never too long, young to give your life to the Lord, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's never too young for you to get saved and live your right, life right for the Lord. Amen? It says in verses 9 and 10, it says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer, uh, cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in, uh, in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. He's just telling you right there, he's saying, you know what? You know, rejoice in these things, be glad in these things, know these things. He says, but you know what? Know that you're going to be brought into judgment for these things. And then he says, therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh for, uh, for childhood and youth are vanity. He is saying this because oftentimes, you know, kids have this you know, idea that, you know, they're invincible. This is coming from someone that would jump off, you know, of roofs when they were a kid because they're like, I can't get hurt. I didn't get hurt. I can say this, praise the Lord, that I've never broken a bone. Which you, say, you would say, you know, amen on that one if you realize all the stupid stuff that I did. That how I haven't broken a bone 
that's the Lord's blessing and you know, provision because I have no idea how I didn't you know, have that happen. I have had stitches, but I've never, had to, uh, I've never broken a bone. And so what we need to realize is that this goes along perfectly well with the prodigal son. The prodigal son who is young goes out, and in uh, Luke chapter 15, it says this, it said, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that, that falls to me, or that is given to me. And he, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. In other words, he gathered everything else, moved out of the house, and said, You know what? I'm good on my own. I got this. It says, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. In other words, he wasted all the inheritance that he had on partying and doing whatever he wanted to do. It says, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to, uh, to a citizen of that country. In other words, he got a job, but he got a horrible job. He, he was a, a pig farmer. And not even a pig farmer is, is the fact that he just fed the pigs. So it says, and, uh, and, he went, uh, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he, uh, and he would fain have fill, uh, filled his belly with the husks. So here's the thing, is that this younger child who went out and said, God, uh, you know, said, Dad, I mean, in other words, this is what he's saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. Can I have my inheritance now so, you know, so I can go do whatever I want? So he goes out, lives the life that he wants, Lives right as living. A famine comes. He has no money. He has no way of really eating. And right now, what does it say? That he wishes that he had the husks or the corn husks that the pigs were eating. And so he got to that point where he, he wanted what the pigs had. And it says, and no man gave it unto him. So he didn't even have, he didn't even have what the pigs... He wanted to go fight the pigs. And I don't think you're going to beat a pig, you know, um, that's eating. I don't think you're going to be able to be like, excuse me, you know, whatever. I think that pig's going to you know, be able to take you out, especially if you haven't been eaten. And he said, and he, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father, that my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. He finally came to his senses, finally realizes, you know what? I, you know what, I've done a horrible thing in the fact of asking for my inheritance now. I went out and partied and did anything else. And basically, he's finding out what King Solomon did, that all his vanity, that life was vanity, that what he was doing by partying and throwing away all of his money was vanity, and that it had no point. And he says, you know what, i done something wrong. You know, I, I realize how dumb I have been. My dad, who you know, has all these things, I've never, I was never without food around him. I never, and he goes back asking his father to be a hired hand. His dad said, no, my son, which I thought was lost, that I thought was dead, has been found alive, and he brings him back and he restores him. That's the father's love for us. That when we go out and we decide to do our own thing, we say, God, you know what? I got this. I'll take care of this. Because realize this. He's a son, right? There's a father and son. So the son never loses his status as a son. Or you can look at it this way. Once he was saved, he was, all, he, he was always saved. He was always his father's son, correct? He was always his father's son. He never had a time to his dad say, I don't want you. I disown you. I had nothing else. His father, you know, the father and the son still had that relationship, even though the son basically spit in his face and said, I want everything that, that you're going to give me when you die. He does that, and he comes back, and what ends up happening? The father sees him off in a distance. And runs to his son and begins to hug him and kiss him and says, you know, my son, which I thought was lost, has now been found. That is the father's love for us. So when we sit there and we think about all the, you know, the, the decisions that we make when we're young, because I was, you know, I was young too. And some people say, well, you're still young. I'm saying like when I was younger, there were things that I thought, well, I'm young. I have time to make it up. Or I can do that later in life. Or I can do all those things later on in life. And God's saying, you know what? Be careful how you think of, you know, things are when you're younger as opposed to when you're old. Because I can guarantee when you get older, you look back and you say, man, I was done with a lot of things. How do I know that? Because I was one of those ones that say, well, I'll, I'll never regret it when I'm older. And then I look back at it and go, man, I was stupid. And so uh, what he's all saying is there's because... 
you see this stuff on TV, you see it in billboard ads, you see it everywhere, that the focus is on young people and upon them doing foolish stuff that they will regret in life, later on in life. All this, I mean, the, the ads you know, you know, for alcohol and liquor are always pointed at younger people. You never see you know, an 80-year-old person on a beer ad, do you? Just partying it up? No, because that 80-year-old already figured, hey, that beer, uh, that beer ad lied to me. They always have young people, they're always partying, they're always having fun, and they never show the ramifications of any of that stuff, right? It's the same thing, you know, with all the other stuff. If I cheat on this test, I'll, I'll be able to, you know, I'll get away with it. And you get away with it, you get away with it, but eventually, you actually have to learn the things that you were trying to cheat on. You can't cheat your way through life. Because eventually, somebody's going to find it, and they're going to fire you because you know what you lied about, you actually know the stuff that you know, right? It's the same thing in everything that we have. And what he's trying to tell here is realize, know that the things in this life that seem so great and glorious when you're younger lose their luster as you get older. And he's trying to tell the young people, don't fall into this trap. Or uh, 1 John chapter 2 puts it this way, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is, but is of the world. He wants you to realize that there are all these things out there vying for your attention. They want your money. They want your focus. They want all these things. And God's saying, you know what? Don't fall you know, into that trap. Because the longer you look at something, the more you want it. The longer that you listen to something, the more you're going to want it, or the more you're going to listen to it, right? I mean, I was a kid, you know, and I would sit there, and I would watch cartoons, and they would always have those advertisements. You ever notice that always the advertisements for toys are way better than the actual toy? Because none of those things, you know, I was watching, I mean, of course, there was a time where I would get that brand new toy that I always wanted, and I would play with the box. Nobody else in here plays with the, uh, played with the box when they were a kid? Oh, I know I played with the box. If it was a huge box, I'd be making a house out of that thing. But you go on, you know, the thing is, and then you get it, and there's been times where I've gotten a toy that I absolutely wanted. You said, Mom, I'll do, I'd do anything. Said, you know, Santa Claus can bring this gift. I get the toy, and it breaks, like, in five minutes. That kind of like brings things down, doesn't it? That toy that you wanted for two, three months, and you're going, man, I'm going to save up all my money. I hope that, you know, whatever happens, you know, that I'm able to get this toy. And then it breaks. Why? Because this is, you know, cheap as all get out. And the thing is, they don't say that on, they're not going to tell you that on the advertisement. Buy this cheap toy that will break in five minutes. And you could have, you know, hours and hours of fun or five minutes of fun. They're not going to do that. That's what he is saying here with all these things that want your attention. They want your, because every single young person you know, or, or close to, you know, close to every single young person wants like a brand new iPhone, right? That's the phone to have. You have Android, it's like, oh my goodness, are you like some sort of like mutation? There's something wrong with you. Why do you have an Android when you can have an iPhone? Because every single, I mean, I see kids that are five, six years old with an iPhone. Why? And I can guarantee you what happens, you know, with that phone. That phone's been dropped like 50 times, and you can't, you can't even read the screen anyways, right? But he's telling you, do not get fascinated with the things of this world. He tells, Paul tells this to Timothy in, uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. It says, let no man despise thy youth, but uh, be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Paul knows that Timothy is young, and oftentimes what happens, ends up happening for a young person is that young people are oftentimes looked at as being lazy, right? Lazy, they're about themselves, they don't want to do anything, you know, whatever. And what does he tell them? He says, you know what, don't let anybody look down upon you because you're young. He says, but set an example for the believers. He's saying, in other words, just because you're young, set an example for the older believers, that, you know, uh, and let them know you're not like the other ones around you. He's saying, you know what? Set an example in the things that you say, right? It says in word and conversation, if you make a promise, keep it. In charity, in your giving, in your spirit, in faith and in purity. He's saying, you know what? By the things that you look at. 
By the things that you look at, you should be sitting there saying, you know what? I want to set an example. I don't want, you know, I don't want to be able, you know, walk into a room and I have to like, shut my phone off real quick because I don't want mom and dad to see what I was looking at on my phone. That doesn't happen, does it? He's saying, you know what? In everything that you do, from you being young, you know what? You can live a godly life and not fall into the pitfalls of everything else that your friends are falling into. You can be in that, that example for those around that when, when things, you know, push comes to shove, that people are able to say, you know what? I know them. You know what? And I can trust them. And you know what? And what they have, you know, what they are living, you know, what they are, the way they live their life, I know that I can trust them and follow them. Why? Because they're, they're not lazy. I can trust what they say. If they say they're going to do it, they're going to do it. They're going to be there. They're going to do all these things. And you know what? I know that I can go to that person if I ever have need of anything. That's what he wants young people to be like. He doesn't want, you know, uh, he doesn't want young people to be look, looked down upon just because everybody else is. But the fact that you can set an example, right? You don't have to do the things that your friends do. You don't have to do, uh, you don't have to have the latest of, and greatest of everything. And parents, let me tell you this. Just because you didn't have that when you were a kid does not mean that your kids need it now. Because the, the, the baby boomer generation had a problem. They said, you know what? I want to give to my kids what I was never able to have. And now you got a bunch of spoiled brats that got everything that they ever wanted. You don't have, just because your uh, child cries and throws a temper tantrum because they didn't get the newest Paw Patrol, you know, toy or whatever, give them a whooping and tell them to be quiet. <laughs> they don't need the latest and greatest of ever. The thing is, is what they need is discipline and for somebody to tell them, you know, it's a two-letter word. Do you know what it is? No. Because by you telling them no now, later on in life, they're not going to be a spoiled brat saying, you know what, well, I'm used to getting everything I want. Why am I not able to get it now? But what you're going to do is also raise a child that is hardworking, that realizes that maybe that they actually need to work for the things that, you know, that they want. Right? So parents, grandparents, don't always just give them what they want. Give them what they need. And what they need most is obviously Jesus Christ. Read the word of God with them. Teach them the word of God. Show them. And if you know what, grandparents, if, you're, if your, kids, your kids are not living a godly life, teach your grandkids to live a godly life. And so hopefully maybe through the grandkids, your kids can get saved. Don't give up on them. Just, you know what, if they're breathing, don't give up on them. Keep on trying to teach them that and show them and say, you know what, I didn't live it all, I didn't grow up in a you know, godly home and I didn't raise my kids in a godly home and whatever. It's never too late to start. The only time it's too late to start is when you're in the grave. Start now teaching your, your, your kids, your grandkids, your nieces and nephews of how to live a godly life and that it's a better thing. That's why I appreciate what Mr. Bobby and Miss Pat do. They've done, they've been doing children's ministry for like 50 some years. I mean, I don't know how that's possible when Miss Pat and Mr. Bobby are like in their 20s, but they've been doing it for like 50 plus years. Do you know why? It's because they know that, you know what, that kids are teachable. And they want to set a godly example so that way that they can go on. But don't sit there and put everything on them to teach their children. On Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, they get an hour of Bible teaching. You have them the rest of the time. Whatever they've learned, expand upon that so that, you know what, they're not just getting it when they go to church. Because you know how many kids sit there and think that the only time they need to talk about Jesus is when they go to church? Talk about Jesus at home. When you go out in public and you're at a restaurant, you know what, it's okay to bow your head and pray over your food and thank God for the blessing that he's given you, uh, that he's given you in this food, Right? There are ways that you can do it. Be that example so that way that kid will grow up and be an example to other believers. Amen? Let's bow our heads and you know, pray. Heavenly Father.